and we are live greetings and salutations beautiful beans and welcome for a very special edition of our world anvil live interviews today we have none other than tracy and laura hickman guys welcome thank, thank you. you it's great much. to be here Oh, we are so excited for you to be here. Uh, you guys have an incredible Kickstarter out right now, Sky Raiders of Abarax, which I am just geeking out about. It's <laughs> it's sky pirates, it's dragons, it's it's everything that we love in life. Um, I yeah, I just I can't even. I'm very very hyped about it. <laughs> Thank you. But, We're pretty excited about it, too. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, I can imagine. Um, I'm going to be asking you all about it in just a moment, but I should introduce you properly. Um, I cannot imagine there is anyone in the chat who does not know who Tracy and Laura Hickman are. But just in case, they are some of the most established and epic RPG designers and novelists in the RPG uh, space. As world builders, they are responsible for so many incredible settings that we all know and love, including Dragonlance and Ravenloft and Tales of Dra the Dragon's Bard. As novelists, you've had 14, 14 New what? York bestsellers. Oh, he yes, has. I've had 14 uh, times on the New York Times bestseller list. 13 just seemed like a wrong number, so. <laughs> 13 is unlucky, you just had to do one more. Just had one more, yeah. <laughs> Oh, shucks. Oh, wow. And as tabletop RPG designers, they were some of the most intrepid first to venture into the space, writing for D&D &D and AD&D, &D, as well as writing adventures for the Serenity role-playing game. Guys, you have been everywhere. You have done everything. I am so not just excited, but really honored to have you here. So thank you so much for joining us today. Well, we're delighted oh, to be you. here, Janet. As a matter of fact, we're kind of big fans of World Anvil ourselves. So hi. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Very exciting. So in that career of incredible shining jewels, what would you say was your favorite moment so far? Oh, wow. Wow. That's there. There are so many and That's hard to decide. so many of them actually involve uh, our fans um, because uh, we, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you who bought the books and read the books and made the books live because you read them. Um, I think perhaps the one moment that comes to my mind, and there are many, many moments, the one moment that comes to my mind is um, when Margaret Weiss and I were at a uh, Gen Con convention and signing books. And we looked up from the table and, and uh, in front of us had appeared this enormous man. And in fact, when I looked up, all I could see was this giant belt buckle on these jeans and and as as I, my eyes went up i saw this leather jacket and you could you could just smell the tobacco waves coming off of this jacket and the higher i got he had this enormous splayed beard and and his hands were were huge and they were curled around this book and he was holding it so tightly that the book itself was waved curved wow. into his hand and it was uh, uh dragons of autumn twilight paperback edition yeah and as i looked up into this face beyond this enormous beard he was trying to speak, but all he could do was weep. Tears were just streaming down this enormous biker's beard. And he finally managed to get out that this was the book that taught him to read. Wow. That he that the cover had spoken to him and that he learned to read to know what was inside that book. And it opened up the world for him. That is an incredible moment. Wow. Holy moly. All, all we could do is come around. It was an odd sight, Margaret and I hugging this enormous biker in front of our booth. But 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 that's that's the kind of moment yeah. that that so often speaks to us. So yeah. we've met many, many wonderful people uh, in sure. in many diverse places around the world. <clears throat> but um but it's it it is the fans their their enthusiasm and and their their act of breathing life into our words. Yeah, readers are the ones who actually 
perform the book. I love that. So I love that. Appreciate that. Yeah, very often, and I'm, I'm sure, Janet, you've had this experience as well. People will come up to you and will try to tell you about your book, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, I, I read it first, you know. Um, but as as Laura mentioned, what we come, what we understand is that they're trying to tell us not about our book. They're trying to tell us about their performance of mm -hmm. our book, and that's unique. I think it was John Steinbeck that said that there are as many books as there are readers because each reader brings his own um, texture, his own thoughts, his own prejudices, his own perspective to the word that's on the page and creates something that is unique to them. So this wonderful collaboration that we have with our readers, with our fans, is is the collaborative moment when the word takes life and 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 becomes a living uh, a living act of creation itself. So yeah, it's our it's our fans I think that really give us our big moments. That's really beautiful. I love that, Laura. Would you say that's the same for you? You know, I was just trying to think of a particular moment, <clears throat> and something funny actually came to mind. Um, I was at the county fair with my children, a uh, hot, uh, hot August afternoon, and we were in the children's petting zoo area. Mm -hmm. And um, But in one of the pens was an ostrich. Mm -hmm. And ostriches, you know, they can be kind of ornery. Anyway, we were walking around this small area, and I hear behind me, Raceland, Raceland, get away from that ostrich. And I turn around, and here is a three-year-old trying to poke his finger through the pen to poke the ostrich. And his name was Raceland <laughs> from Dragonlance, from the, from the very, I don't know what you'd call him. I can't say just naughty. He was not good. <laughs> <laughs> so that for me was a great moment. I had to actually, I, uh, as soon as we left the petting zoo, I had to call my husband. <laughs> I thought you were actually probably going to say that it was when you met uh, Malcolm Reynolds at the convention. And oh my gosh. That was a good moment. That was a good, <laughs> you can see it in the picture too. Yeah, I'm, I he, mean. He actually came, we wanted a selfie with him. He came to ask for a book and we had just run out. It was so sad. Oh. <laughs> and, and I like, can we have a, a selfie with you? And I, we were going to hold the camera out on himself. He goes, no, I used to be a photographer. Let me do it. So he took the picture. It was a great picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a nice moment. It was a great picture. And Laura looks like a 16-year-old Beatles fan in this picture. I could She's just, just, oh, my yeah. goodness. I have seen that picture and it is something to behold. Uh, just a word from the Pride, Pride Ascending says, no doubt, um, but Dragonlance was the one I read as soon as I conquered my dyslexia. So I thought you oh, might. Oh, thank you. Thank that. you. What a wonderful story. Thank you. Well, let's hop into our questions because, guys, I have so many questions for you today. We're yes, going to please. be talking a lot about Sky Raiders of Abarax, which is your new project that you're, you're kickstarting. I'm so hyped about that. Just a few stats about that for those curious. $400,000 raised so far, 68 hours to go. So guys, do not miss it. If you if you are interested in Sky Pirates and Dragons and Epic Things, then this is <laughs> the thing. Who is not interested in Sky Pirates and Epic Things? Right, exactly. Then this is this is the 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 D and D five E setting for you, guys. I've mangled that perfectly nicely. Can you tell me a little bit more about Sky Raiders of Aberrax? Well, Sky Raiders of Aberrax is actually the first setting that Laura and I have done a uh, game setting that Laura and I have done together since Dragonlance. I think. Yes. Wow. So, um, so we're very very excited about it. Uh, it's. Uh, uh it, it's a world I, we love the pirate genre anyway as the dead gentleman used to say everything's better with pirates and so <laughs> we uh, and we've always loved that genre but um I, I i used to be a pilot when i was younger i i flew uh sailplanes gliders when i was younger um and always had this great 
affinity for flight as well. And so the idea of tall ships uh, sailing through the air just had, had such a romantic call for both of us, I think, that mm -hmm. we really wanted to explore that. Well, and it wasn't just that. We had been um, meeting with our partners, Joe and Kim Bory, um, for, I don't know, we'd had several meetings. And one afternoon when we were together, the idea of, of pirates and flight and the tall ships um, just kind of exploded into the room. And the, you know, we're just the energy level was you know, off the scale in the room. And we were so excited because we knew that this was the project we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you, you had like an aha moment, a eureka moment with it. Yes. And the, and the more we got into it, the more excited we became uh, for it. The, the world itself just was so compelling for us. Um, and the idea of horizons, I think, was hugely compelling for us. Um, the idea of knowing what's just over the horizon, you know, and sometimes when you're hiking, it's just around the next corner. You just want that next vista. This is what we wanted to be able to explore. So that. we th that was pretty much where the essence of where everything uh, began, and that's where our world building began. We usually like to start with the world world building and have the story evolve out of that. It feels Amazing. more organic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you, the idea came to you as a as a eureka moment. What did you do next? How did you how did you turn this from oh my god this is so cool into okay how are we going to develop this? How are we going to put this together? We went for a long drive. Yeah, uh, yeah, we do a lot. That's of that. what we do. <laughs> Amazing. So there was a lot of spitballing, a lot of throwing ideas back and forward. Mm -hmm. A lot of throwing ideas back and forth, and and we'd like to go on long drives um, because it it leaves us in a very confined space, and because we're together in a smaller space, it. Um, it means we can't wander off on, on somewhere else and do something else. Um, we right. actually did this once uh, years ago with a screenplay. And we were writing a screenplay for uh, really a, a, a darling film. And um, which was actually <laughs> optioned. Yeah, which was actually optioned. Has not been made. So. But um, we, we wrote this screenplay and and it was just really long. And we, and we think, and I'm looking at it and thinking, oh, you know, this is so perfect. And because everything I write is perfect <laughs> immediately. It comes out of my fingers, perfect. Okay. We have rules about that though. Okay, sorry. Okay. What's the rule? We check our hats and our ego at the door is rule number one. Oh, that's true. I forgot that rule. <laughs> Just for a moment. Yeah. Just for a moment. So we get it. So we said, well, look, we're going to drive up we were living in St. George, Utah at the time, and we had to drive up to Salt Lake City for a conference, which is about a five hour drive uh, by freeway. And so we said, well, we'll take it with us and we'll see if we can cut it, you know. I'll read it aloud. Yeah. yeah. So we start on the road and Laura starts reading the scre screenplay aloud on the road and she gets down about through the first paragraph. And I, I'm driving and I say to her, who wrote this? This is awful. This is one of the worst, most pedantic writing I've ever seen in a screenplay. This is terrible. Well, and what we discovered is, because this was the first screenplay we'd done together, uh, you cannot, you have to read it aloud after you commit it to the page or say it aloud as you're committing it to the page. You need to know what it sounds like out loud. And so we, I took a red pen, which I always have with me now. Yes, he always carries a red pen in case. <laughs> and began slashing lines. And we slashed, I don't know, about 10 pages. We, we spent the entire five hours redlining this screenplay and bleeding onto the page. Finished our conference in Salt Lake. Turned around five hours more all the way back home doing the same thing and i think we we had taken out almost 18 pages we'd taken about 18 pages out yeah. by that point wow. and then when once we got home we realized we hadn't quite finished with it and so the next day we got back in the car <laughs> drove two and a half hours to las vegas had lunch had lunch got back in the car <laughs> and two and a half hours back home in order to get it finished <laughs> 
totally worked. <laughs> but it worked. But it worked. I, I love this. Um, so uh, whenever I have a problem with my own uh, creative work, whenever my husband has a problem, we go for a walk and we do exactly the same thing. We don't have a car, we don't own a car, but uh, we do exactly the same thing, but on foot. And we just throw ideas back and forwards. And we say, oh yeah, I'm it's like writer's surgery, right? We say, oh, I'm having a problem with this, or I'm having a problem with that, or mm. I know that this is wrong, but I don't know why. And then we we unpick things. We we do exactly the same thing and we spitball until it makes sense. And then, and then we quickly try and write it down, uh, <laughs> which yep. sort of brings me to my next uh, question how do you write down and organize your world building as you're going like like what does that process look like oh well <laughs> it looks are like we going to show and tell here yeah <laughs> this oh, is actually this. yeah this is actually our um book that we've used for sky raiders it has our notes our the beginnings of our notes nice in it incredible <laughs> And the, and, and the interesting thing is that all of that is very iterative. It changes a lot as, uh, as we go. Um, it's, it's not unlike, in my mind anyway, it's not unlike the process of, of taking away everything that doesn't look like the statue until the statue remains. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and refining it and honing it and, and, and discovering it. We, um, we're a big believer in, in, worlds and stories that are organic and characters that are, are, are organic. They, characters' actions they have to have motivation. They have to have structure and background and, and rationale behind them. Mm -hmm. Worlds the same way. It's true. I, in fact, it was really funny. I asked Tracy the other day, so we have all these brick buildings over here. Where are the clay pits for those bricks oh. on the map? Show me. <laughs> Well, there's clay pits in the, uh, on the map now. Yeah, <laughs> and there's actually a whole brick industry that has sprung up recently in our world that we were unaware of the economics of this brick industry before she pointed out that we need a brick industry here in our world. <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. So um, obviously, Dimmy and I, husband and wife team, we create together. You guys, husband and wife team. Basically, I'm here asking for tips. What are your secrets? as uh, as a, a husband and wife who do paired creation and co-authoring? Well, the first one I think Laura's already mentioned, which is that we, we check our egos at the door um, because it doesn't have any place really be between us uh, in, in, in our writing. Um, there have been days, I, somewhere there's a picture of me holding a copy of Eventide from Dragon's Bard and Actually, just before we did that, he made me take this book, which we had, had just gotten the copies of, and go, this is my, this is me, this is my book, oh, out here, this is my book, this is me, this is my book, and keep them separate, because one gets very emotional yeah. about that, and it's, yeah. uh, we, we remind each other that we are separate from the things we make, which is hard sometimes. <clears throat> and yet it very important for one's well-being too yeah. now, um what's another one what's well another we one? had we had um of course when we were first married we worked together and created a lot of adventure games together and um and then we had four children and then we had four children <laughs> and, and i did work at home a little bit you did work at when home. we went well, to Wisconsin. To to be fair, uh, uh, Laura was always part of the work that I did, and I would yeah, and, and because we had started writing games together and designing games together when we were uh, young married, and the uh, when when the children came along, we would still design things together, and even after I became uh, got my work at. Uh, TSR in Wisconsin and started writing for the Dungeons and Dragons company directly. And I was employed by the Dungeons and Dragons company. I would still come home and we would still talk about the things that I was creating. Uh, and, and I, I had my own contracts on occasion too. Yeah. I, I do freelance. And, and I think I, I mentioned just before we went out live that I had actually hardwired a modem into my phone <laughs> to their mainframe back in the day. And, you know, everything was like linear line edit. It was really scary to type with, but, and I'd have to input things that way. 
But I, I want to make sure, I want to make clear, however, this was with their permission. She didn't like sneak in oh. Mission Impossible <laughs> no, style and hardwired into the computer <laughs> in a balaclava, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm oh, a yeah. I'm awesome, a hacker right? with two toddlers. No, <laughs> I'd have paid money for that. By the way, I'd have, I'd write that book. Is all I'm yes, saying. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. So, but there came a point um, when we had, I don't know, three or four children, I concentrate really hard when I'm creating. And I just realized the house was going to burn down if I just want, if I kept writing Yeah. and I had to give it up for a season. Actually, I did PTA letters. I mean, I'm kind of a compulsive writer anyway. So I, I did what I could <clears throat> while there were small children in the house, but then came a day and Tracy came to me and said, he said, the kids can make their own sandwiches. They can do their own laundry. I want to write with you again. Hmm? And Laura did not hesitate a moment. She said, no. Yeah. Why would I do that? <laughs> Everything's going so well. Why would I do that? And I meant that we had known at least two other couples who were writing couples who had gotten divorced or argued constantly because they wrote together. And so I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> let's not do this to ourselves. <clears throat> and then he goes, I want you to think about this. <laughs> I want you to think about that. You just go away and think about it. You just think about that for a while, okay? And, she, and so I did, I asked her again and she finally said yes, but, and, the, and we established immediately the ground rules, which are, I mean, I had been writing professionally for like a, over a decade by this point. Yeah. And and when one does that much writing, one just develops, you know, one skills. Skills. Yeah. You and had habits. skills. And I had skills. And mine were rusty. I wouldn't. I would even admit that. Um, but so I said, we need to do something you haven't done before. We need to, to make me feel more comfortable. And so we decided to write a screenplay together just for fun, um, for a one-off to see how that yeah. went. And we found out actually that our business relationship is actually smoother than our real life relationship, <laughs> which is interesting. <laughs> I mean, we have a great marriage, but business, this is, we this, keep it this, simple. This, is, this interview is going downhill really quickly, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> And real life is so complicated. Real life is complicated compared to screenplays yeah. and scripts, children, and stories. Yes. And all of that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like when the when the book closes, when it says the end, nobody has to do the dishes afterwards, right? Like that's that's right. That's it. That's right. Nobody says where's dinner when it's seven o'clock at night. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, I, I've learned never ask where's dinner. You should ask what would you like to have for dinner is a much better question. There and we go. In a much smoother life. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Is there a division of labor between you? Do you, is one, does one prefer to plot and one prefers to do characters or, or do you both get in on everything? We story weave at mm -hmm. the beginning. Um, we will, and, and in that story weaving, the world, it's like turning a light on. And the world begins to have light and life. And then from that, people spring up and sometimes they have names already. I mean, it's really interesting how people will practically appear in a room when we're talking, um, when we're doing the story weaving at the beginning. And then Tracy will go away and write a beautiful battleship um, outline, outline yeah. for it, which yeah. I totally appreciate. And we have been known, uh, Tracy is often the one who sits at the keyboard is the word Smith. And I get it after that. And I am, I've forgotten what we called that and titled that, but I'm the one that pretty much guarantees that the story stays on track. And I don't mean unnaturally on track, hmm. but he does come to me and say, oh, I found a character. We need to talk about this. <laughs> because if somebody suddenly, you know, pops into your story, you got to know who they are. Awesome. Um, so we agree to these things. We do call it guardian. Guardian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Guardian of the story. And then I go through and I edit or write over the top of his writing, which he's 
been so kind to me about it. I have to say there have been very few instances where we've quibbled over words at all. It's been great. And sometimes I hardly touch it. And sometimes I say, nope, we got to do this. And I'll write on the back of the page. And, and it's just been very um, pleasant pleasant mm -hmm. relationship yeah amazing I, well the one of the other rules is that the manuscript comes first um and 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 so the the integrity of the story and the world is is more important <clears throat> than our individual perspectives or viewpoints it's it's what's best for the story what's best for the character what's best for the world mm -hmm. and and that has i think also been a very strong influence in 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 how we work together. Yeah. Um, yeah. We also uh, we also have a very uh, basic philosophy um, when it comes to outlines. And as Laura said, I'll write a battleship outline, which is a, a, a very I mean, it's a chapter by chapter breakdown of the story and it and, and a very detailed outline about what's supposed to happen in the story at different points. The interesting thing about that is, though, that that can change. I mean, it's, it does change. And it does change. I mean, no. I should, shouldn't say can change. I, we've never gotten all the way through one without changes, mm. um, either adding a chapter or taking a chapter out or, or finding people. And in fact, we have a philosophy that has to do with marbles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you do it. I, I, oh, okay. I need to hear about this. I have to know what this is. <laughs> okay, this this we believe is is a, a really guiding philosophy for us in terms of world design and in terms of story creation and and, and writing, and that is that uh, an outline, um, and for that matter, world design, but an outline needs uh, to be approached like a handful of marbles. Okay, if you write an outline and then you hang on to it too tightly. And, and insist on sticking with the outline, then the characters, which are the marbles in here in the world, the characters start all popping out and flying off in different directions and the integrity of the world kind of comes apart and you end up, you lose all your marbles. <laughs> um, on the other hand, if you take, uh, at least for us, if you take kind of this free approach and you let the characters do whatever it is that they feel like they need to do and the world just kind of is there and then, and, and, well, all the marbles roll off and you lose your marbles again. Right. What, what we try to think of all of this is that you, you cup the hand. And in cupping the hand this way, you create a form, a, a structure. Yeah. Okay? William Goldman says story is structure. So if you, if you form this structure and then you let the, the marbles in the world and the setting all settle naturally, into this shape, the characters find their place, the world elements find their place, the setting finds their place, and you get to keep your marbles. <laughs> so an outline is a great guide for what this is, but then you need to have the flexibility to explore those characters a little bit within that structure, explore the world a little bit within that structure, and, and to make changes and in our experience, those changes actually end up being rather minor in a lot of ways. Well, sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes uh, they're major. And sometimes you realize you're trying to shove your characters into doing actions they would never do in a million years, just for the sake of shoving them through the plot. And really, we've given up on doing that. We don't do that to our characters. Well, either the characters need to change or the plot needs to change. In because... fact, there was a time when Tracy was writing a book um, where the characters were saying they were traveling. The characters they were, were traveling. traveling. It was one of our books. It was in one of the Bronze Canticles books. Yeah. So the characters are traveling across the country and they come across, they come over this ridge and they look down at this big long valley that runs up into the, into the uh, snowy mountains and they just stopped. And I'm at the keyboard writing dialogue. And as I'm writing the dialogue, the characters are talking to each other. But as I'm reading the words, they're really talking to me. And they're saying, 
we don't know where we're supposed to go. We're, we're kind of stuck here. Maybe we should just camp out here until the author decides what <laughs> we're really supposed to do. And, and I'm like looking at the characters on the page. And what, what's with you guys? Come on, you got to go up the, the plot says you got to go up the canyon up here and head over to the mountains. And well, we don't know why we're going there. We're just going to wait. They like refused. They refused to, to go, go where yeah. I wanted them to go. They didn't so have had, the motivation to do the thing somehow. They had no motivation yeah. to do the thing. So I said, okay, fine. So I went back the, about three chapters and realized that the entire motivation that I thought I had given them was all in my head and I hadn't actually put it on the page. So fine. So I go back three chapters, rewrite come back all right we're going to take another run at this ridge here and everybody goes up the ridge and say yeah no problem we know right where to go and <laughs> off they went and i okay wow, what a relief sometimes you actually have to listen to the characters they'll tell you what the problem is yeah absolutely and so it that changes that it changes that battleship plot <laughs> yeah it changes the plot but that's that's what that what that means yeah. world building is very much the same way that 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 if you've got if you've got islands flat floating in the sky there better be a pretty good reason why there are islands floating in the sky and it better work yeah yeah and preferably not just oh it's magic because that's no <laughs> that'd be okay. pretty complicated magic sorry you guys are no you guys are speaking my language and i'm i'm hearing so much here that i'm just like yep yep uh-huh uh-huh me too so this is <laughs> lovely it's, it's amazing to hear all of this let's talk about that actually let's talk about airships so i noticed when when um i watched the kickstarter video very carefully and i noticed one of the things that you guys have is is diagrams of how the airships work can yes. you talk a little bit about that and why that was important for you when you were putting um sky of abarax together it's for the very reason that tracy just mentioned we believe that the magic in whatever world you're in is going to have specific rules. And that's one of the things we're very careful to one to put together correctly and then to adhere to because people know when you've broken the rules, mm. your reader knows. And uh, that's a betrayal to me um, when I'm reading a book and then suddenly my a character does something completely off the map you know unless they're gonna ex give you a good reason i'm like maybe i'll put this down till later because i it's it's just very important that you know how that's going to work and so tracy gets very excited actually about <laughs> the inner workings of um you know we're including something that is almost like a machine here but in a fantasy setting done with magic so how does that work and we had to come up with we had to come up with that. the sylph engine is 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 how that all i mean mm -hmm. I, I i'd flown sailplanes when i was younger so i and so the sensation of flight is something that is very important to me yeah and uh for that matter um laura and i are both we, we love boats particularly sailboats and there's there's a lot about sailboats that uh, and sailing ships that is fascinating for us the, the mechanics of how all of that works I, you know the great tall ships one of my one of my favorite um, moments actually was on a business trip to Portsmouth and I was able to visit the uh, um, uh, uh, the victory oh wow Portsmouth UK yeah Portsmouth UK <laughs> oh yeah their naval their naval museum is out of this world was absolutely fabulous and and to walk the decks of Nelson's ship was just you know fabulous for me but all of that also informed what we're doing here so in order to, so how do you get a ship to fly a ship that size that weight how do you get it to fly and make the flight believable yeah and for that matter how do you make the mechanics work in fact we were yeah. at a, we were at, at doing a, a sky raiders game <laughs> uh, demonstration game just uh, last Wednesday, and one of the players at the table uh, before we got started, he said, "How are you going to make these work? Because I know how sailboats work. I know how ship sailing tall ships work. How are you going to make these ships fly?" Yeah. 
And I explained <laughs> it to him. And he said, oh, wow, that that works. Oh, OK, so, yeah, we have that. We've got these. We have this sylph engine in the the sylph engine contains this the sylph material, at, which has its own history and and its own very deep, dark secret, actually. Yeah, and it's very rare and valuable, very rare and valuable. Nice. And it sits at the heart of the sylph engine, which is surrounded by this complex mechanism of, of magical reflectors that all that move both in and out and in their orientation in order to get the, the lift properly and to get the reaction from the self against the aether that surrounds the world. Yeah. Um, the keel itself is a self keel and is empowered by the self so that it gives the ship direction and and bite into the into the aether. And then all of these, all of these reflectors that are placed around the center of the sylph itself, are all controlled by um, these uh, lines, these uh, cables and and ropes, that are all situated in, in vertically next to the engine in a particular order, to for how they control, and they're on both sides of the engine. This is called the harp, mm. because the the harpist ship's harpist is the person who runs the engine and adjusts all of these different cables yeah. to position the parts of the engine in order to get the proper lift to empower the keel properly and also to keep the ship in the prior uh, proper orientation um uh, roll orientation and pitch orientation amazing so these all of these cables that are situated here um they hum because of the interaction with the engine. And so they make a noise as the ship flies, a sound as the ship flies, a chord. And the ship's harpist has to listen to the chord in order to know that the engine is properly tuned and is, is, is working properly. My so little opera harp singer heart right now is just like, ah. <laughs> you're making me very happy with all of this. So it sounds, it sounds very, technical but magical but well worked out and i am completely in love with this my next question would be how are the players going to interact with technical elements of the ship without slowing down the action of the game now i play this as somebody i, I ask this as somebody who has played um campaigns with ghosts of salt marsh i I did one for Watsi um, and some other some other bits and pieces. Whenever you're in a ship, there is the, oh, yes, there's action and fun. Oh, yes, but actually we have to do insert technical ship stuff here. And then there's some more fun and, oh, no, but we need to something, something. Wait, how do cannons work? What's that side of the ship called? Oh, God, what are we doing? Um, <laughs> how how are you, um, how do you balance that within within Sky Raiders to, uh, oh. to help to help facilitate play and and story whilst keeping those technical elements. Well, there's a couple of a, a couple of ways to do that, of course. And every uh, the wonderful thing about tall ships for me is that they are such complex machines. I mean, even in their day, um, the uh, our, our own understanding of tall ships is that they are such amazing complex machines. They were cutting edge in their time. Yeah. And, and yet they took this entire crew to properly man them and to run mm -hmm. them properly. And uh, every, every line on the ship had a name and every line on the ship had a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and, and everyone aboard the ship had a duty to perform in order for the ship to properly run. So one of the things that I, uh, it's actually one of the things about the app that I like very much. And it's one of the things uh, we, we have an app that's associated with our game. It's not required, you know, if you want to run it as a, a standard role-playing game under 5e, absolutely, everything is there for you to do so. But we have uh, an associated app with the game that's called the Living Tome app that allows you uh, to look at the books and the maps through AR and enhance the books themselves through augmented reality. Yeah. Um, but it also allows us to do things um, like fly the ship. So everybody that's at the table can take a post on the ship yeah. and perform a function. 
one of you can and and do so through the app so one of you can can uh, operate the helm and one of you can uh, uh can operate the prow yeah which is actually to lift the ship the, the ship up or to point it downward and uh, they're two separate um wheels uh, on the quarter deck for yeah. that um one of you can work the rigging in order to uh, uh to to set the, sh the sails and and uh, properly how much sail you're going to put on for the ship at that time one of you can be the harpist and can, well, can be down below working the harp and getting the self engine to lift the ship uh, uh properly um uh, yeah the sailing master uh, uh so as each yes. person takes a position in the ship, the app allows them to actually run a mini game to perform that function. And together it all combines to the sailing of the ship. It lets everyone simultaneously do something as opposed to everybody taking a turn at doing something that really takes place at the same time. So it's one of the one of the one of the things about our app that I'm very excited about is to take um, a lot of those out of game moments and put them back in the game. I love that. I think that's so clever. And again, one of the one of the big problems that often happens in in aerial combat and ship combat is that some players are making decisions and some players are not making decisions and and some people feel useless and some people feel overwhelmed and some people feel like they don't have the requisite knowledge so i for example know nothing about ships so i spend an awful lot of time just like with a cheat sheet trying to read off ship shippy sounding words um and so so that sounds that sounds really supportive we actually had an audience question that i'd love to uh, ask you now because i think it's it's something that is on a lot of people's minds, and I want you guys to set the record straight on this. Oh yes, so please. With the app, I know that um, I know that the app is coming out with the game, but it will be possible to play the game without access to the app, right? Absolutely, yes. yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. there's no necessity to use the app if you if you don't have to. You can you can just use the the material that comes in the book. You That's can right. just play it as uh, as a straight up five e uh, uh adventure conversion uh, oh. without having to worry about the app at all but there is there are some magical things that will be missed yeah um, you'll miss some magic but, if you do that but, but if, it's, if it's not magical to you then that's fine yeah, yeah. i wanted to ask about this because i know that you guys we we had a chat before we we kicked off live you guys are all about the story all about the experience all about that that sort of amazing amazing immersiveness um, and so what other ways is the app designed to serve the story and that game experience? Well, we, you have to understand as, as I'm sure you do, um, we're old school gamers. I mean, we've been at this for, well, long for time. A uh, number yes. of years. Yes, it's a lots of uh, like, years. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Safe to say decades, really seriously. And. <laughs> We, and so we understand the importance of having the game take place at the table. Um, the play itself always should be at the table and it all should take place between us as players around the table. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the wonderful thing for us about this app. I know a lot of people have, have commented and asked and worried about the idea that we're trying to put the game onto an app when in fact the opposite is true. Um, we're trying to use this app as another tool of storytelling and gameplay. So. Well, I, have we talked about the fact that, you know, there's always that awkward moment where the GM is trying to push um, a message, maybe slide it across the table or say, you know, Lenny, come here, I gotta tell you something. And the whole table knows that he's getting told something they don't know, and it takes you right out of the game. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody has to stop. Yeah, and there's there's that complete like the suspension of disbelief is gone. Like the the mm -hmm. idea that somebody organically knows something that they can bring to the table as a character, it's it's disappeared. Uh, we we talked about this earlier, and um, yeah. my problem is always the DM will say, oh. So you know this and you know that and you know that this is this. And then that player will turn to the table and say, 
okay, so I tell everyone that. And then yeah. all of that magic is gone. But that's something that you guys have really addressed by using the app, right? Right. right. One of the things that uh, one of the things that the uh, GM can do in the game is to give specific messages to specific players through the app. Yeah. And so, you know, if um, I, I personally am really looking forward to the to a wonderful moment where uh, where players are at, uh, all at the table and the GM is telling them. You're approaching this ancient ruin that has been buried in this jungle for for centuries now, and and as you as you approach the ruins, you see this the the broken towers of this uh, bridge that crosses the river, and and one of the players at the table then has a message come to them on the screen that tells them what the name of this bridge was and the and the history of what happened here and how the the ancient elves once crossed this bridge and, and, and in 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 their tragic march into the jungle and to give that to the player through the app and so the, so that the player then can can say to the rest of the group I know about this place. I've heard the legend of this place and have them tell the legend gives them that moment. Yeah. And 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 doesn't interrupt the the flow of the game at all. They can simply say I know about this place. This is where the elves once crossed and marched into the forest never to be seen again. It adds that wonderful story moment without having to interrupt the play of the game. At the same time as one of the things that's on the the Kickstarter campaign that you can that you can read on the site, it also allows for you know the the app to say okay one of the characters one of the player characters has just been cursed, pick one and the DM the GM can then pick a player that is cursed, tap on it on the app and then the cursed player gets a message saying. Don't tell anybody, but you've just been cursed, and this is what you need to do as, as your character. Mm -hmm. All of that happens without anybody else being aware of it at the table, and you can role play that at the table. So it's not a question of, of, of it's, it's not a question of taking over the game. It's a question of enhancing the actual play at the table. And that's that's the absolute guiding rule for us is that everything on the app needs to be an enhancement to what's happening on the table. And speaking of the app, we need to mention Joe and Kim. Yes, uh, Joe and Kim Bory are our other partners in this uh, adventure. We've got actually a number of people that are helping us with this. Um, Joe and Kim Bory um, are good friends of ours. And uh, actually, they met each other while working at Electronic Arts. Oh, wow. Uh, Joe, yeah. Yeah, Joe was a designer there, a, 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 a programmer, an engineer, and uh, and Kim was working there as a UI UX designer, um, which is why our Kickstarter looks so beautiful. And, <laughs> I have uh, to say, guys, if you if you don't go to the Kickstarter to back it, just go to the Kickstarter to look at the page because oh my gosh, like you'll be licking your computer screen. Is all I can say. It is just exquisite. <laughs> It is such, it is like the, the poster child for excellent Kickstarters and it's so beautifully put together. So even if even if you're not into 5e or you don't want to back it for whatever reason, you're mad, but it's fine. We still love you. Go and look at the Kickstarter because it is spectacular. It's really incredible. Thank, Thank you. you. We think Kim's done such a tremendous job with the look of the of the site and and uh, and Joe, Joe is, is the genius behind the app. Yeah, he's the one who's building the app, and and he is a genius. Plus, both of them are also gamers. I mean, they uh, we I I tried to get in touch with uh, Kim Bory the other night uh, to um, make a change on our Kickstarter page, and uh, she her texted response was, "I'm in the middle of Ladies Night." Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, nice. So I'm, it's going to have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Those are the kinds of people you want to work with. Well, we also got some really great other people that, are, that we're working with. Um, I saw some very big names. Would you like to drop some names? Because I was I'm really gonna, impressed. Yeah, I'm absolutely going to drop some <laughs> do names. Do it. Do uh, it. Let's hear uh, some clangs. 
Yeah, Joe, Joe Manganello is uh, going to be working with us. He's uh, a, a good friend and a, and a, a tremendous uh, Dragonlance fan and supporter of Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, he's agreed to consult with us on this. So he's actually going to be helping us out with a lot of the character backgrounds and um, and the ancestry backgrounds that we have here in the uh, in this campaign, as as well as the world, uh, we think the world of Joe, and are really excited to to dig into all of this with him. Um, we also have uh, with us uh, a pair of uh, my favorite artists. Uh, first and foremost, Larry Elmore, who um, uh, did the original Dragonlance covers and mm -hmm. uh, helped us early on with the Dragonlance. Um, art to sell the project actually to the company um bless him I, I i called him up to see if he'd be interested in doing this and uh he said well i'm i'm actually just finishing up the last two commissions that i've ever wanted to do and and i'm just going to paint my own things from now on just what i want to paint um but then he said but i'll do one for you <laughs> so nice. Uh, Larry's going to be doing a cover for us uh, for the books and also Matt Stowicki who did um, a number of the Dragonlance covers for the books and for games and uh, wonderful artist he's he's so excited about this I, I, I email chatted with him yesterday and and uh, he said well I, I was trying to wait until the Kickstarter was over before I contacted you but <laughs> but when do we get started he's excited <laughs> he's so excited and and Carl Prusser, who um, was the uh, uh, he was the composer for the Dragonlance movie, uh, and was also a huge Dragonlance fan. He's he is a film score composer out of Hollywood, so yeah. we're very thrilled that he wanted to be part of the project. Yeah, and you yeah. can actually hear. I I contacted him and said, "Would you be interested in working on this project?" And he said, "I he said I'll write you a score. I'll write you a theme." And I, we told him about the background, about how, um, how the, all the people on this island were the descendants of prisoners from hundreds of years ago and how they've, been, uh, they've heard the legends of their uh, homes across the ocean and, and, and places that they could never reach again to go home again and how they suddenly have discovered again these ships to take them across the water. And... Uh, he said, great, I'm going to write that. Wow. And wrote a theme for us based on the idea of these imprisoned people suddenly becoming free. Amazing. Um, and, it, um, and in fact, it's the themes that you hear on the Kickstarter video. Yeah. The music that you hear under the Kickstarter video. And, and bless him. I, he said, I said, we got this Kickstarter video. We're using your music. And he said, could you send it to send the video to me and I'll score it. Oh, wow. So he did. So he, did. He, he actually scored. We have this Hollywood score for our Kickstarter video. <laughs> Not too shabby, can I just say? Not too shabby. It's nice to know good people. Yeah. It's nice to know good people. Speaking of good people, guys, I could sit and talk to you easily for another five hours. I am so excited to, <laughs> just to chat with you, to, to hear all of your stories, and of course, to talk about Sky Raiders of Aberrax. But our audience have so many questions for you as well. So just oh, before oh, you sure. wrap up, I'd love to hop in on some of those, if that's okay. Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Our first questions. Now, remember, you don't have to answer anything you don't want to. Okay. okay. But our first questions are about books and more books because these guys are hungry for your books. The first one is from Pride Ascending who says, are we going to be getting more Dragonlance books? This is my favorite series growing up and I would love to read more. You are going to get some more Dragonlance books. Margaret Weiss and I, in fact, are writing a new trilogy. The uh, first two novels actually of this trilogy um, are already finished. Wow. Okay. And the first, uh, the first one uh, we just actually saw, I think we're seeing galleys on those right now. Uh, and those are scheduled to be published uh, next fall. The first the one. first one is scheduled to be published next fall. Fairly but the first two are written and completed and we'll be doing the third one here this next year. Amazing. So yes, you have new Dragonlance books that are coming. And we're very, very excited about these books. It's a, uh, we feel like it's a, a, a we feel like they are a great capstone to Dragonlance and 
uh, a gift um, from us to all of you. Amazing. Well, maybe when they come out for pre-order, you can come and talk to us about them again. I don't know. I don't know how I'd you might feel about that. I'd be delighted to do that. <laughs> yes, please. You see, I, I have to do it on air, so you can't say no. This is oh, this is okay. the, eh, you see. <laughs> yes, it, it's on record, Janet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm a I'm a brogue, in case you're wondering. Part bug, part part rogue. Yeah, I Excellent. use my powers for evil. Um, <laughs> Fares has a question: Is there any chance the bronze canticles will ever be continued? Oh, we love the bronze canticles. We love that. We would love to, to uh, work some more on that story. There are actually what several more books in that series that we haven't had the opportunity to write yet. Mm -hmm. And we would love to go back to that world and visit those people. Here's hoping this time. Here's hoping. Okay, so yes. that's a that's a we'd love to. Let's see if there's let's see if there's an opportunity. Yes, Larkstrong please. Carter has a question about Sky Raiders of Abrax. Just to confirm, it's a campaign setting and player's handbook, not a pre-written adventure. Is that correct? There will be adventures, right? Yeah. But in, in addition to. In, in addition, addition to. to. Yes. Amazing. So, so what comes as part of the as part of the base pack? I saw it was two books, right? I, we've actually yes, backed it already. Demetrius saw this thing and he was like, "Mine now, give, <laughs> give sorry. now." So uh, we we are definitely getting a big pile. Uh, <laughs> but well, we but have, what can we what can we expect? Um, the, we the basic is the two books, and the two books are um, uh, these the uh, player's guide. Yeah, the Sky Raiders uh, Sky Raiders handbook. Mm -hmm. which is a player's guide and then there's also the um uh sky, sky master's Man. almanac which is a gm's guide for the world and the player's book it primarily deals with um the the, the island of abarax the particularly the arrhenius coast where most of where all of our characters originate anything they might know already anything about that they might know everyday life yeah and then the almanac which is for the gm is designed specifically to look beyond that horizon to what the what the world is like beyond that um and, and depending on where we reach on, on our stretch goals actually we may actually reveal the entire world in that one um, guys back this thing now we need to know <laughs> <laughs> no no that <laughs> That is so that is not right. Only back it if you feel it is for you. you. Feel, that's right. <laughs> so those are the essential two things. But then, of course, we've got a number of other really uh, remarkable things. This is, I think, one of my favorites. This is the prototype that we we received. But this is the um, this is the scroll. Oh, it's so pretty. And it opens up. It's a dice scroll. So it it opens up. There we go this way mm. on the back of it we have this is the prototype map so it's not the actual oh map goodness. but we'll have a map of the uh, local region here for mm -hmm. that they'll be exploring first then on this side actually we'll um there's a place on this side for miniature figures there's a area over here to hold your dice but then on this side we'll also have printed the images of uh famous characters from history which you'll be able to use your app and look at. And if you look at the historian, he will tell you historical information about the place you are at in the game. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you look at if you look at the uh, botanist, he will tell you about the floor that is around where you are in the game. Or uh, the, the storyteller will tell you legends about the place. It's it 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 allows you to, uh, as a character or as a player in the game, to kind of ask your character what he knows. I love that. That is such a good idea and such a great way to to seat knowledge within the perspective of the character, not the player. I think it's genius. I love it. Uh, Nerd Building has a question. How much of your world building becomes behind the scenes information for you guys? And how much becomes uh, so what percentage essentially makes the books, I think, is is the essence of the question here. From all of the stuff that you guys know about the world, what percentage gets delivered to to the players, to the to the GM? This is interesting. I think so. Um, yes. We always talk about uh, an, an example out of Tolkien, actually. Um, I can't remember where we what scene it is, but 
Um, oh, I do. Well, go ahead. Yeah, it's um, it's the scene on Weathertop, actually, uh, okay, as yeah. the hobbits are uh, with Strider and crossing uh, towards uh, Rivendell. And um, it's, it's on that journey, actually. And uh, Strider tells, uh, is singing the song, The Lay of Baron and Luthien. Mm. And as he's singing this song, the hobbits ask about it, and, and Strider tells them it's a story of two lovers from long, long ago. And as he's telling them about this, under the starlit night with the campfire and the smoke between them, we get a sense that the world has roots, that it has depth, and that there's more to it, that these people come from some place. They come from legends. They come from, from, from a world that has lived and continues to live. Yeah. Um, when, when that happens, it's romantic because we have, we have the romance of that distance and, and, uh, and the legends. Um, on the other hand, if you pick up the Silmarillion and you read the story of Baron and Luthien, it moves from romance to concrete, to real, mm -hmm. and it loses some of the romance in that. So this is all part of our vision of horizons, which means that we actually have a map of the entire world that this takes place on. We have named the places, we know where the empires were, we know what's happened out here. We're not gonna tell you. Part of that romance, part of that mystery is, is, the, is not knowing, it's that, it's is that whimsy, it's that surprise. That. We actually, right, we know a lot more about the world than we're ever going to say. And we'll impart as much about the world as, as the players need to know as we go so that it becomes a discovery for them. And a discovery for the GMs as well, because yeah. as they will know more about the world, obviously, than the players will and, and rightly must. But there is more world for them beyond the boundaries of their knowledge as well for them to discover. Um, it's, it is that compelling romance, I think, that is, that is so important for us yeah. uh, foundationally to what yeah. we're building here. Yeah, absolutely. Beans, I hope that you are listening to that because that is like my entire seminar about exposition is, is basically that. So um, <laughs> guys, that was, yeah. Uh, Nerd Building says, I'm going to explode. <laughs> I, think, I think they are very happy and uh, yeah, so am I. Just before we end, uh, two very quick questions about uh, Sky Raiders of Abarax. Will there be novels? This was one of my questions as well that I did not have time to ask. Are we going to see novels in this universe? We'd love to write novels in this universe, and and de depending on how we get through in this Kickstarter, and uh, I think that that's certainly something that we want to explore doing. That is something on the horizon. Yeah, we, or maybe just, just over. over. Just <laughs> over. But you, if you want some ideas that our our commitment level to all of this, back here on the wall here. This is actually a, uh, a set of pirate coins that my wife bought for me. There's Best like wife pieces ever. Of, pieces of, <laughs> a, oh yes, absolutely. She actually bought it at an auction, which is a story all in and of itself. Yeah. And, and it's got pieces of eight and doubloons oh on God. it. And, one, and, and it's kind of inspiration here for us. That is incredible. So novels, yes, I certainly hope we, so. We'd love that. We'd love to. Amazing. And a very Kickstarter uh, specific question from Val B. Gem, who asks, any stretch goal for a bestiary with new aerial threats? Oh, hmm. Well, we're hoping to include much of that in the gems. Uh, well, here, let well, me write that down. Yeah, write that down. <laughs> That was a great idea. There you go. I I had a whole set of questions that I didn't have time to ask about um, how you're managing aerial combat, aerial threats, how how aerial combat changes the way that cities and castles are built because you've got to defend against aerial threats. But you know what, guys, we are out of time. So that's too bad I've... because I had an entire map that showed something to, relative that that whole thing. <laughs> well, all right, then we'll get off there. Okay. okay. Oh my gosh, Pride Ascending says it watches the gears start to turn in Tracy's head. <laughs> yes, I see them too. <laughs> Guys, it has been such a complete and utter wonderful pleasure to have you here again. What's the timeline like for Sky Raiders of Aberax? 
Um, I know that there's 60, 67 hours now left on the Kickstarter, <laughs> right? Yes. So when when are we going to get our mitts on these beautiful books? Where, well, where, our understanding the is I, we're, what we're saying at, at this point is that it will be November of 22, which is about a year. And that's a pretty good turnaround time. It gives us time to write it and for Kim to lay it out beautifully. Yes. With and all to the get art it printed. she's collecting and then get it printed and mm -hmm. shipped. We are we are concerned as many people are today. We're we're very concerned about supply chain issues, yes. right? Yeah. And so um, we have we have elected to we have elected to go ahead and spend the money where necessary. We will do air freight. Um, we're also um, yeah. doing a lot of our production work domestically where we have to. Uh, just to ensure that we'll have product on time and get it uh, get it to people. Amazing. It's, it costs it costs it's expensive, but um, but uh, this is our whole aim is to make people happy. We so. want we want to get these into your hands <laughs> and to have you join us here in this really exciting world. So Amazing. we'll do what we have to do. Folks, that's the kind of integrity you can expect from these guys. I am so excited about this. The link is in the chat. So if you want to check out Tracy and Laura's Kickstarter, it is right there. Click the link, go and have a look at it. As we always say, if it is for you, then why not back an amazing product that will give you so much joy and written by, can I just say like, I, I want to say experts, but I'm going to go with legends of the industry <laughs> here. What a lovely thought. <laughs> And uh, if it's not for you, then why not share it on social media? There's 67 hours left on this project. And even if it's not for you, you can make somebody else's life incredible by introducing them to something which is super amazing. So I just have some quick thank yous to do before we sign off. Of course, a massive thank you to Tracy and Laura. Thank you so very much for coming to talk to us today. Oh, it's been an honor. We've thank been so you. delighted to, to come on this and... Well, what can I say? Well, like I said before, we're, we are World Anvil fans. And we are Tracy and Laura fans. What can I say? Uh, <laughs> I, of course, I have to do a massive shout out to Secondhand Samurai and Demetrius who have been throwing links and keeping us all organized in the chat. A big thank you to Shadow Phoenix, Auli, Drunken Panda, to uh, oh, Good Grief, Tillers, Nerd Building, Ilian Blaze, Kuma Wolf, and Stiltis and ECC Books for, and uh, Mikhail Osterberg for all of those incredible bits, subscriptions, everything else. We are going on a raid and our raid shout is light up the forge. So stay exactly where you are because you will get 250 of your finest anvil points just by sticking around for our raid as we go to talk on Foundry VTT's channel with the amazing Kaora. We're talking Matt Themba. It's going to be epic. You're going to be inspired. So uh, yeah, you go enjoy that. And in the meantime, grab your hammer and go well built. <laughs>